streets underwater Y'all know what's going on, it's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Bank, and welcome to the show. I got my partner, Michael, here, and we're going to be answering some questions that we got from Chad, a student in Utah, uh, that we've been doing for quite some time now. And uh, these questions happen to be uh, some very good ones. Uh, like Michael was saying earlier, like some of the best ones that we've had, right? But Michael, you want to say anything before we get started on this? No, just just the fact that like we like we discussed that this is probably one of the best letters we've received. And this is more intriguing, and I guess the more the more we get into this, the more the 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 better the questions will get. Yeah, 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 yeah. This one here is something else, you know. So we're gonna jump straight into it. And I hope that uh, those of you that are listening that are not in school, that are you know just my regular uh, subscribers, I hope that you find uh, these questions intriguing as well. And, uh, and if, like I said, if you have any questions that you want uh, me and Michael to answer, just hit them up in the comments section and we'll take care of that for you, right? Uh, so, but let's get to the first question. The first question is, is there a strong presence of gangs in your facility? Which ones are more prominent and how hard is it for an inmate to remove themselves from the gang culture? I'm going to let you start that one out. Uh, this institution... It hadn't been, but it's it's about to get there because they're the this commissioner said that prison is prison, so it doesn't matter where you're at. So, uh, but other institutions is very very prominent. Yeah, you know, it was um, most of the institutions I've been at. It was always gangs. It was always a lot of gangs. Oh yeah, everywhere else. Yeah, like you said, this this facility, not so much, but it's picking up. It's picking up. You start to see. Uh, all kinds, Bloods, Crips, Vice Lord, Gangster Disciples, um, Aryan, all different type of Aryan nation groups, War, Brotherhood, yeah, yeah, all of that, KKK, all of that is picking up because they're bringing people in. This facility is more like a staff facility, like a worker camp. Work camp, yeah. Yeah, and uh, now that it's a little bit more open, they anybody can get here as long as you minimum restrict meet the requirements and so on and so forth and yeah it's more prominent which ones are more prominent have you f seen a a tick in any particular group you know as far as having the most people i don't know being here for so long you know of course of course not but uh, you know other facilities of course northwest was more was predominantly crip yeah. And uh, yeah. so, but it hadn't. The facilities that I was at, though, was it was either Crip or GD. You know yeah, what I'm saying? And those are the main ones. Those are the main yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this state, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then it depends on uh, overall over the whole state, yeah, it's the Crips and GD, right? Most GD is Gangster Disciple for those of you that don't know. Uh, but depending on what facility you're at, you'll see more Bloods and Vice Lords. Because I heard mm -hmm. recently there was more Bloods at, at Morgan County than, than, than anything. I've really? Heard that, I've heard that recently. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't heard that, but I know they're strong somewhere. They have to be somewhere. And one of the things that, let me explain something too that a lot of people may not be aware of. Uh, one of the reasons that they have high numbers in this facility and not that facility of different groups is because, like, the Crips in this state uh, have what they call an NBA, no bloods allowed, right? Yeah. And any bloods that come to that compound where it's predominantly Crips, they'll run them off the compound. So what the system do, the people that run the system here, they'll put most of the bloods in a facility, you know, way on the other end of, a, of the state, you know, mm -hmm. just so they can keep trouble down, right? But to answer your question, uh, at this facility, no, but it's getting there. Uh, I don't think that you can really avoid it now. Mostly everybody that's coming into the system. Nah. They're young and they're affiliated. Yeah, and this 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 institution is going to see something that it's never seen before. Yeah, know? this facility is not, in my opinion, too, not prepared for that. It's not. Yeah, not prepared for that at all. Oh, um, let me see. What's the other part of that question? How how hard is it for an inmate to remove themselves from the gang culture? Um, let me say it like this, right? 
I was a GD for years, and I was able to retire. And that, and that, that works different uh, for a lot of people. I know gangster disciples can retire after you serve 20 years, if you're 45 years or older, right? And in good standing. And I was able to do that. Uh, but just getting out of it, just because you get tired of it, it's not that easy. I mean, you know how you hear the stuff where it's blood in, blood out? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they mean that. Yeah. yeah, they mean that. You know, you get beat in, you're gonna get beat out. And on the way out, it's rough. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've seen people get beat down to the ground. I'm talking about till they can't even get up off the ground. It is hard to get out of a game unless you reach that status that, you know, where everybody respects you and, and uh, you know, they look at it like you, like you might be too old or outgrown it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they'll respect it if you got that level of respect. But other than that, it's not easy. <laughs> It's not easy. No, nah, you can't just say I'm ready to go. Just I don't want to do this anymore. Now, nah. You, some 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 may respect if you say I'm doing it for religious purposes. You know. Yeah, that family. that'll be. The, and they, but they're gonna watch. Yes, yeah. we had a lot of guys that do that. Yeah. At the facility that I used to be at, and uh, and if it proved that that was just a cover, <laughs> nah, they are gonna beat you down. Yeah. yeah. yeah they are gonna beat you down, and that's just that on that. Uh, or give you the opportunity to come back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. To avoid the beating. Uh, now let's get to the second question, right? So I hope that answers that question for you. The second question is, the prison atmosphere has an unwritten inmate-created code that inmates follow, and much of it revolves around respect. Is it possible to not affiliate with a gang while keeping yourself out of trouble, respecting fellow inmates and gangs, and maintain respect with the officers that you see daily? Hmm. I think the the older people can, because you know when I first come in in '96, you know the older people they they respected the older people. Then I don't know if they do now because I haven't been in the prison environment in so long. But but right. I know that back then, you know the older guys, they didn't bother anybody. They didn't, you know they didn't bother them. Yeah. So it was it was it was respect. You yeah. Know, you know, ump, pop, you know something. They yeah. Got. People that weren't affiliated, they didn't have to worry about. Being pushed on, and yeah. when I say pushed on, I mean beat up, robbed, whatever the case may be, because like you said, they had a level of respect for mm -hmm. everybody as long as you was a stand up dude. Yeah. And when I say stand up dude, I'm some, I'm talking about somebody that lived by the criminal code, not some, not <laughs> like a law abiding citizen. You yeah, feel what yeah. I'm saying? That's not prison abiding. That's not stand up in here. You yeah. feel what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you got to stand up on that aspect of it, right. A lot of people get that twisted, but. Uh, I don't think that uh, the officers might see it differently, though, because he asked on the second part of the question, uh, respecting fellow inmates and gangs and maintain respect with the officers you see daily. Uh, I don't know if that even comes into the calculus when you're talking about worrying about what the officers think. Well, not when it comes to the code, no, because nah. because it's it's blue against gray, you know, so it's, it's, it's prison against officers yeah so we don't nobody really cared what the officers thought or no anything not really that. not really as long as the officers stayed out of the way in the sense that you know they wasn't trying to mess up the floor of the prison mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying messing up what i call that prison economy as long as they were not interfering with that you know it's everything good and unless they were contributing to it you know, yeah. if they were yeah. contributing to it that, that was even better but no nah, it's not most of the time you know living by the code you don't really care what the officers think you you well, you do what I call shoe showing you tap dance you know what I'm saying you got to play your role you know honestly as if you care you feel what I'm saying but you really don't yeah those conversations in the rooms in the cells is not talking about well what do you think officer such and such is gonna think if we do this you know what I mean That's don't nobody care that you better not even say that you know what I'm saying <laughs> they're gonna be like what are you talking about him you or her whatever you know if they're not contributing to the to the prison economy they, they absolutely mean nothing you know what I'm saying. Now you do have those exceptions. I'm gonna say that you do have those exceptions. You have some of those officers that just they seem to transcend and don't nobody want to really do anything to mess them up. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's rare. Well, it's like if you have an officer working your pod and you got a hustle going, mm -hmm. and you got these young cats come in and 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 try to disrupt the pod, and this officer doesn't bother anybody, let you do what you do, right. and everything. And then right. you come in and disrupt the stuff. Like, hey. Yeah. Chill out, man. I got something else going on. You exactly. don't know what other people got going on. Exactly. So, 
as far as an officer and respecting things like that, that as far as the prison code, yeah, that that because you don't want to. If I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, you don't want to do anything to make the officer have to do his job. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? If they said that they might know what's going on, but if it's allowing, you know what I'm saying, that stress to be sucked out of the the pod or the building that you're in, they just lean back. You know what I'm saying? But when you have those officers that are overbearing and and doing things that we interpret as beyond their job, it creates a lot of stress. And then when you have somebody that younger or older that comes into the pod that's on the mess. Uh, you try to diffuse that, you know what I'm saying, so that that officer won't have to interject themselves into the situation, yeah. so to speak, right? Yeah. All right, let's get to the third question, right? What words of advice would you give anyone, primarily youth, involved in gang activity and may not have the family or parental support that they need? What advice would you give them? Hmm. I think gang life is not the answer, you know. When, when we're younger and we do that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're looking for acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's the easiest thing to be accepted in because they're, they're going to accept you. I mean, because I'll tell you a story. This Back in like 97, mm -hmm. this guy came in mm -hmm. to, the, to the system. Uh, so the Crips took his shoes. Okay. A week later, they put him down. He's mm -hmm. still walking around in his state boots. The person that took his shoes still got his shoes, but they put this man down. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is, what, what is that about? You know, so it's it's not a. You know what it was about? It was about <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Uh, at first, they take the shoes from you. They they see that you you weak in that way as they define it, and then they put you down for the protection. You know what I'm saying? They let you know by not giving your shoes back. You really don't mean nothing to us. I don't want nobody around me that lets somebody take the shoes. Right. If, I'm, if I'm in that. Absolutely right. I agree with you on that. But you know, I, what I've come to understand, man, is that fear will make you compromise just to survive the situation. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and think about that. He was so afraid. He had to be, in my opinion. He was so afraid that he didn't even, he probably didn't even ask for those shoes back. <laughs> you got to give me mine. He walking around the whole time with these state boots on, cutting into his ankles, bleeding. Man. And he see this dude over here with his Jordans on, probably some nice <laughs> new balances or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And didn't say a word about it. Yeah. That's fear. Yeah, that's real fear, you know, and that, and that happens a lot. But what I would say, to piggyback on what you just said, what I what advice I would give is that um, you're gonna be faced with situations your whole life on trying to fit in here or there, right? And if if it's a must that you feel that you need to fit in somewhere, I would say that you need to try to fit into something that's not gonna potentially cost you your life. Uh, cause you to have to compromise your moral compass, but again, most of the people that's joining gangs are confused. They don't have that moral compass to guide them. You feel what I'm saying? And that, like he said on the last part of that question, they don't have that family or parental support. Yeah. So they haven't developed that standard that they need to live by. Yeah. So here comes somebody or this group that is willing to accept anything. Yeah. Anything, you know what I'm saying, and, and they just want to be a part of something, especially in this environment. You know, most people uh, that I've encountered and, and, and that join gangs at one time or another, at the beginning of it, they did it because they were scared. Yeah, I know that. <clears throat> I know they did. You know what I mean? And it's it's really hard for people to understand that when you get put in this environment, man, and I'm not trying to knock on the administration or anything like that, but they don't really know what to do about it. They don't. They don't have any yeah. clues as yeah. to how to deal with that. No, because they don't know. They don't know what they're looking at, really. Because I got suspected for some pictures mm -hmm. that the man was throwing up something totally different yeah. from yeah. what they suspected me of. Yeah. I was yeah. like, well, "Why are you suspecting me of this?" And it's not. I didn't even have the pictures in my in. in, in Physically have the pictures. They intercepted right. the pictures before I got them. Right. I could see if I had the pictures in my cell, and you right. come search my cell and say, "Oh, we're gonna have to put this on you because that." Right. I never even got the pictures. Yeah, I know plenty of people that are labeled one thing or another, and they actually have nothing to do with that organization. Yeah. Just, that's, <laughs> the system is wrong. But on a broader scale, what I was what I was trying to say is that I don't think the system has any idea. The people that's running the system have any idea how to deal with the gang problem in the system because the gang problem comes into the system 
with a whole lot of other things going on, you know, poverty and, and yeah. abuse and, 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 and growing up in an environment where it's crime is how you get down and how you get your money. Uh, I don't know how you change that when you get people in prison. I don't know how you change that when that's what's going on in prison. The only thing I think is that you show them a better way if they, they have to accept that. But again, if I, and I agree with you, but they would have to, the people that run the prison systems would have to make a commitment to recognizing, in my opinion, the humanity of the individuals that are inside gangs and say, okay, we may not know everything about how you got to the point where you thought this was a good decision, but let me show you this option. So what do they do in the gang units when you have to go? Well, when go you go to the there? gang unit, you get <laughs> you get these pamphlets where you learn uh, these cognitive skills on trying to reason out uh, ways of coming to the conclusion to not do this or to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other than that, it's just separating you from the general population. This is my opinion. Separating you from the general population for an extended period of time to make you irrelevant to what's going on on the compound and giving you time giving you time to see life differently, right? But the problem with that program is that while you're separated from society, locked down most of the time, yeah. you're not getting to practice these new techniques that you're learning. You understand? Because you're locked down most of the time and you're in the unit, and when you do come out, you're separated from everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's no real hands-on application as far as learning, taking this, what you just taught me, to reason, and then I got to put it into play. It's no opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. Except with the people in that building. In that building. You don't get to communicate with anybody outside that building. Uh, anybody that writes you, it has to be family members. Can't be no gang members. And if you got family members that gang them, they can't even write you. And then I know you can't get prison to prison when you're in the... No, in the none building. of that. None yeah. of that. So you don't... So you become irrelevant. Okay. You know, like, gangs are set up like organizations. So if they lose the CEO, so to speak, they may replace them. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? You're just taking people out of rotation... And when I say rotation, I mean associating, affiliating with the gang. You're taking people out of rotation. And then the gangs go on and replace that individual. And then when that individual gets out, they either usually get put back in the same position that they were in, or they've had time to say, man, you know what, I don't want this. But after some small amount of time, a small period of time, they usually end up going back because there are no options that you can touch on available in here. Just none. Yeah. You have to create it yourself, and it's hard to do when you don't have, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses, but you don't have any money. If you have ideas to try to start a business or do something different, you don't have the opportunity to do it. Most of the time, because you are a gang member, even if you went through the unit, you're not even allowed to get into certain programs here. Yeah, because and that's, that's, that's going to always follow you. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. always going to follow you, and then they always want to make it hard on you. Now, some, some, sometimes it's, you know, after people have gotten to know you, They'll open you up to the opportunities that are there. But for the most part, even after you've been in the game unit, you know what I'm saying, and then you get out on the compound, they're looking at you like, okay, you went through that program because you didn't have a choice. But we got to watch you now for another year or two years. A lot of people come out of the game unit and end up getting out of prison sour because, you know, you wanted me to stop living this way, but you didn't give me an opportunity mm -hmm. to do anything else. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. And here we go. They just stick to the, stick to the script and go through and, they, and everybody plays the role and that's what I get tired of in here. I really do. It's almost like we become complicit in playing our role going through programs so that we can get to the next level of this survival of this environment and then the administration is cool with that even though everybody knows this is it's not genuine. Yeah. It's not genuine. It's just for the money for them. It's just for the money for them in a lot of cases. And for us, is to keep you off our back. Yeah. And that's terrible. Because yeah. you cannot get any growth out of that. And there's no real help. No real help. It's all, it seems, and I don't want to discredit anybody that might be sitting somewhere in an office and coming up with these plans that they have sincere, you know what I'm saying, intentions. I'm not, I'm not talking about you. But for the most part, the people that put the programs that these smart people come up with into practice, they're not putting them into practice the way that you think. Not at all. Not at all. No, Not no. at all. And that's, it amazes me that you spend all this money to come up with these programs and there's no oversight to make sure that it's being done exactly Implement. the way that it was supposed to be implemented to create the result that you're looking for. And even so, even even outside of the, the gang unit or anything, the, the programs that we get 
are geared for people that are within a certain amount of time flattening. Yeah, what about two those, years or less here? Yeah, yeah, what about those other people that are that are going to get out before they flatten? Okay, let's go a little further than that. What about the people that are never going to get out at all? It it should be it should be your priority to change the environment in here. True. Just like you want to change the people before they get out, give them another option to look at. You should want to change the environment in here, even for people that are never going to get out. Because if you change this environment, the individuals that make bad decisions out there and end up in this environment, they won't come into this violent, hopeless place and then become worse. They can see change. Yeah. Yeah, you got to come up with something that's not focused primarily on, or exclusively, I'm going to say exclusively on, people getting out and then people getting out within two years yeah 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 it's terrible it's terrible but i get it it's only so much money to go around it's only you know i get that you know what i mean but you, it's like putting a band-aid on on the problem and you know here we go you know let me get to the uh this next question what do inmates appreciate most from the daily dynamic professional working relationship officers and inmates have I'm going to let you tackle that first. We discussed earlier, you know, and I think that the thing that you can, that, well, me, would appreciate is to be treated humanely, treated like a human being, treated, yeah. you know, of course I did what I did, but that's that's not your job to hold it over my head or to, to, to try to punish me. But a person that treats you as a person, yeah, you know, you can appreciate an officer that helps you or, right. you know, like... Like I said, when 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 mom died, mm -hmm. that 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 officer went straight to the warden when he found out mm -hmm. that you know the mom was getting ready to die. He went straight to the warden and mm -hmm. made sure that I was able to go. Mm -hmm. Stayed on it that whole time. Mm -hmm. Within a few hours, I was out there. Mm -hmm. So I, I I I appreciate that. Yeah. So because he did he did above and beyond what yeah. he really had to do. And 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 that's that's my thing. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna piggyback on that again. I think that what I appreciate the most in that dynamic is that you have some officers that they recognize your humanity, they show compassion, and they still do their job. Yeah, which, which you, you can't can be do mad. your job. You can't be mad at a person yeah, doing your job. Yeah, you can't. I'm not going to be mad, especially if I'm doing something I ain't got no business. Yeah. But this person say, look, now you know better. And then they got to pop down on you. You feel yeah. what I'm saying? But even in, in those situations where an individual is not doing anything, right, you, you want to be able to have... From time to time, you want to be able to have conversations with somebody that's not locked up. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I'm always curious about what's going on with technology and business and stuff like that. And I like to be able to talk to people that might have their own business or know a little bit about it or can give me some insight about it. And that's rare because a lot of officers won't go there, won't have that conversation because they'll be labeled as somebody that is too cozy. Mm -hmm. with the inmates you know what I'm saying you're too friendly with them and for me that established barrier uh, I, I don't like that at all it's almost like yeah I can help you just by giving you some words of encouragement or advice but I'm not going to do that uh, because I could lose my job or I just don't care about you anyway I don't care if you uh, succeed or fail you feel what I'm saying and I'm not asking a person to care about whether I succeed or fail I'm just asked to treat me as a human being. That's all I want. That's it. That's all I want. And in a way, in a, let me let me clarify something. You know, because uh, a lot of people on you know the law enforcement side, they'll define that in a way different than we define that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And when I say treat me as a human being, I'm saying do for me what you would want somebody to do for you. If you're in, the in that way, if you were yeah. in this situation. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Treat me the way you would want to be treated if you were in this situation or somebody that you love was in this situation. Yeah, people have to be held accountable and be, you know what I'm saying, uh, punished for the things that they do. But that don't mean going overboard with it. Yeah. That don't mean that. That don't mean that. That makes me think that one time where we had this officer uh, that was trying to get the inmates to pull grass up with their hands. <laughs> You know what I mean? Sweep the sun off the sidewalk. Yeah, I'll let that. You know <laughs> what? You know, but I don't. I don't. Yeah, treat me like you would want to be treated in this situation. That's what I mean when I talk about recognizing my humanity. Right. All right. Let's get to the last question. 
In what ways do officers lose an inmate's respect? I'm, go ahead, you go ahead. I have to say that the, the, what we're talking about, treating people badly. You, yep. you lose my respect. You know, if yeah. Like, I overheard a conversation. Mm-hmm. One of the mental health guys had done, he, uh, he busted a sprinkler head. Okay. So they put him out on the rec yard, supposedly to clean the cell up. Right. So the captain was like, well, did a, where is he at? Is he on the rec yard? Well, yeah. Is he wet? Well, yeah. We'll leave him out there until after camp. And it's cold outside. We're going to teach him. It's cold. Right. It's 30, 40 degrees outside. Right. We'll, we'll teach him. We'll leave him outside for it. Leave him mm, outside. That's terrible. I mean, now that, you lose respect. You lose yeah. complete respect. Because, yeah. man, you didn't even have to do it. This man's mm. mental health patient, and you know that he's got behavior problems. But you're gonna teach him a lesson, right? By putting him outside in the cold, yeah. and leave him out there. I, I I agree. That's that's fine. And I'm gonna say something else on that, right? I I don't I don't I don't particularly like officers that uh, they cherry pick how they treat people. Like they will treat one group of individuals over here with the utmost respect. You know what I'm saying? And concern and care. And then these. Another group of individuals they coming down hard on, right? Now, I'm not talking about whether it's justified or not based on the behavior, right? Because the individuals that they treat with respect, uh, they cross the line every now and then too. Mm-hmm. But you have that benefit benefit of the doubt with them. And I believe that if an officer can have the benefit of the doubt with one, they should be able to have the benefit of the doubt with all, whether they're cool with those individuals or not. And that's just not what you see. I think officers that are not consistent Yes. For me, you know, you lose respect. Yeah. If you're not consistent, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about being consistent and being a dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm talking about being consistent with, you know, treating people fairly. And that's what I, I, I just, I just don't like that because, and, and another thing on top of that, I don't know why officers or people that run the prisons believe that we don't recognize that. <laughs> just because we don't say nothing. We don't say it because we, we get punished if we do. But don't think that you're fooling me. Yeah. You're not fooling me. I just have to play the role because I'm in a situation where I don't have any, you know, ain't nothing I can do about it. That's, that's it. Yeah, but don't think that you're fooling anybody. You're not fooling anybody. I recognize you for what you are and who you are, but I can't say nothing and do nothing about it. Mm-hmm. You know, but that's that's me on that one. You got anything you want to say before we wrap this thing up, though, Michael? Other than I, you know, I appreciate the questions, appreciate the information that you put in that letter. Uh, Keep them coming, cause that was that that was a that was a pretty good letter. Yeah, that was that was good. Appreciate you, Chad. You know what I'm saying, and all of y'all out there that's listening, out there in Utah, appreciate you. I really do. Look here, send us another good one. We'll knock that out too, right? Uh, but we're gonna wrap this thing up. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. I'm and I say peace. What?